buenos días y buenas tardes. Creo que ya podemos ir arrancando con, con este espacio. Nuevamente quisiera agradecer a todos y todas Good los morning que se han and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for attending and for participating in the dialogue. There will be a simultaneous translation for English and Spanish since we have people participating from Caribbean islands. So if you go down below and you go to the Zoom menu, you can choose the language that you prefer. Once again, thank you. You. We know that we are about to end the year. We have so many commitments happening. Our agendas are tied. So thank you for that. Thank you for spending a couple of hours with us to be a part of this instance that we are organizing with a specialized meeting of uh, uh, family farming of Mercosur and also the executive secretariat of the Agricultural Council and as part of the fifth anniversary of the decade of the UN for the family farming. The decade has been going on since 2009 when the General Assembly stated that the period between 2019 and 2028 was going to be devoted to acknowledging the importance of family farming in the eradication of hunger, reduction of poverty, and the production of agri-food systems that are sustainable. And now from the regional office of the FAO for Latin America and the Caribbean, alongside with our partners, associations of family farmers and others, we are organizing this instance to think about the different challenges, the different goals that we have achieved, and also future opportunities that will come along for us to strengthen rural communities and also family farming overall from its core in the territories with people at the core. Halfway through the decade, we see that here in Latin America and the Caribbean, the region has made so much progress in giving visibility to family farming, but also we could innovate in the design of instruments and also public policies to acknowledge the key role that this sector plays for food security and, this, and the transformation of the agri-food systems from the regional launching we did do here at the FAO alongside with the partners that we have working on this, alongside with the partnerships that we have here represented by Mariano. Medina, we have worked to promote the sector in the global and regional plans of the decade, but also to fulfill the mandates that we have as international organizations and regional integration mechanisms. And for us to go over what has been done is that we proposed to have this activity and there will be key stakeholders here sharing their strategies and things that have been proven successful to improve the quality of lives of rural families. And we'd like to do it this week because we are pre preparing for the World Forum of Family Farming that will take place in the headquarters of FAO in Rome next week. To start, then I'd like to show you a video from Dr. Mario Vecchia, our Deputy Director and Regional Representative of FAO for Latin America and the Caribbean that was unable to join. However, he took the time to send us, to send us welcoming remarks. So please, let's play the video. Estimadas y estimados participantes. Dear participants, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this instance of commemoration and reflection organized jointly by the Executive Secretariat of the Central American Agricultural Council and the Specialized Meeting of Family Farmers of the Mercosur. Five years ago, the countries gathered at the General Assembly of the UN gave us a unique opportunity to put family farming at the highest levels of the development agendas and to move forward in the creation of 
customized policies for the sector through dialogue and participation in 2019 with the participation of 21 governments, civil society organizations, the private sector and the academia. We were witnesses of the commitment for implementing the actions of the Global Action Plan as well as promoting international cooperation and the coordination of efforts to further promote the potential of family farming in the transformation of agri-food systems. With the approval of the national plans in Latin America and the Caribbean, they have become an active voice in the development of regional strategies. This has allowed for the creation of participative and innovative solutions that strengthen and will strengthen family farming in its social, economic, and environmental dimensions. From the FAO, we have supported the regional leadership so that it inspires other regions of the world, fostering more countries to take concrete actions to favor family farming. This effort is channeled through our technical platform on family farming, where we have already shared good practices in Latin America and the Caribbean, of course, with over 80 countries. Today's meeting gives us an instance for a reflection regarding the challenges that we will face in the following five years. In 2022, we organized the Latin American and Caribbean meeting on family farming, gathering 200 representatives from 24 countries and to set a regional work agenda. This agenda revolves around strengthening the exchange and dialogue around urgent issues like the adaptation to climate change and investment to overcome inequalities. Now more than ever, we have to continue working on these issues, building regional goods that would allow the countries to move forward in an inclusive rural transformation agenda where family farming is a key Player. Also, we have to continue to highlight the solutions that we have built together in the region, bringing those solutions into global instances like the World Food Forum that will take place next week in our headquarters in Rome. We are convinced that with the implementation of the decade of Latin America and the Caribbean of family farming, we have achieved concrete responses to these challenges. Through the strengthening of family farming, we will be able to develop agri-food systems that are more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable. That will offer a better production, better nutrition, better environment, and of course, a better life overall for everyone want to move forward and to leave no one behind. Thank you, Pablo, and thank you to our regional representative for the kind remarks. And as he mentioned, the regional instance has a key role to play in the process of strengthening family farming. And precisely because of that re reason, we have joint work and we are supporting different mechanisms of uh, regional integration and that is why I wanted to thank the presence of Dr. Lucrecia Rodriguez, Executive Secretary of the Central American I know that she is commuting at the moment, but I'd still like to like, give you the floor. And thank you so much for attending in any case. I know that she is traveling at the moment. She is joining from the airport. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today in this five-year commemoration of the decade of family farming as a SICA. This is an instrument that we have taken ownership of in order to guide our work toward that family farming group. And it has allowed us to complement this with our strategy for the development of the territories. And that is where our efforts are being made. Even though we still need to consolidate certain instruments and certain policies, it's not prevented us 
us from conducting the actions in the territories with a strategic goal for the mid in and long term. So our commitment is to build a single roadmap. We will make it there at a different pace, but we will get to our goal. And that is the point, that is the objective. It's about sharing parts of the activities and challenges that are still ongoing. So from our side, we are highly committed to the program. And as I said it earlier, it complements the actions that are a priority for us, which is to develop economic growth, and that this is reflected in the development and in the sustainability of agriculture in the region. With that, thank you so much. And I apologize once again because I had to board my plane, but we're very happy. We're thankful for the team with FAO, with Laudaro, because it's been an instance to share within the region and to learn from one another. So thank you so much once again. Thank you, Lucrecia. Have a good flight home. We know that those instances of connection, we know what that's like. And it's important to highlight that the implementation process of the decade and the creation of the decade is one concrete result from social participation that we have in the year of family farming. Without the participation of the organizations of farmers and producers, this agenda would not have the importance and the reach that it has had. So to give welcoming remarks, I'd like to invite Mrs. Maria Noel Salgado, representing the Partnership for Food Sovereignty of the Peoples in Latin America and the Caribbean. It is a platform that has been working on the implementation of the decade alongside with the partners that are gathered under this organization. Maria Noel, I know that you are commuting to, so I thank you for your time. Good morning. I'm commuting, but I'm just going to a training to train 30 women for agroecology. I am within the city of Montevideo in Uruguay. So thank you so much for the opportunity of giving my remarks. I am an ecological farmer. I am in the area of Colorado. Those of you from Uruguay know the area of Canelones. And I am also part of a team that gives training particularly women in the rural areas, training for agroecology, training for life. In this case, I am here representing the technical and political secretariat of the Alliance of the Partnership. And right now there are 20 organizations that are part of that at the Latin American level, organizations of family farmers, also ecological farmers, fishermen, organizations of indigenous peoples, organizations that work on lives that work with livestock, organizations of consumers and other organizations that work with us in the different territories. It is a very difficult work to be able to organize ourselves to promote food sovereignty understanding that this is a key tool to transform the agri-food systems into systems that are more sustainable, more self-sustained, stronger, where the food or, or where the role of smaller producers is key to produce food. In the consultation that took place prior to the FAO conference that took place in February, we talked about one priority, which is the priority regarding governance, which is key for us, interacting with FAO and other UN agencies to understand how there are different roles to play by the different organizations and in the process Says, we have to think about systems that are more just and sovereign. And a key element for us in the decade of family farming 
Tiene que ver con los desafíos has to do a with the challenges that have to do with that transition towards agroecology. We believe that that is key for sustainability. It is key for growth, not only in terms of production, but also in terms of the possibility of making a living off of the production. We believe that there are so many strategies and some of our countries are working on those strategies to go through this transition, but however, we need to strengthen the process so that the systems are able to become more res resilient. And we believe that this would be the major challenge of the decade of family farming, and definitely we're happy to tackle that in the different countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Big hugs, everyone, and Muchas gracias, Mara Noel. Have a great meeting. We will have a couple of hours to identify the priorities, the challenges, and the different uh, roads to get there, identifying the things that have worked, the things that haven't. So please, everyone, if you have, a, if you have questions or comments, do use the chat box. There are many stakeholders that are represented here. Here, so feel free to use that instance to ask questions, to engage in a dialogue, not only based on what's being presented on the screen, but also based on your experiences in relation to family farming. And to finalize the opening remarks, I'd like to thank the participation of Dr. Fernanda Maldonado, General Director of the Secretariat of the Minister of Fishery, Farming and Agriculture. She's also the coordinator in Uruguay and Uruguay now has the pro-temporary chair of that organization and soon REAF will commemorate another anniversary. So thank you, Dr. Maldonado. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Pedro, and good afternoon, everyone. Yes, we hope to see you to have our REAF meaning we have a great team working for that. And to continue on, I'd like to mention a couple of things. Uruguay, during the previous pro tempore chair in 2022, we created consensus to have a second regional conference organized in the, in the offices of FAO in 2022. And with that, we drafted the Charter of Santiago and in the specialized meeting, number one of 2023, regarding the decade of family farming, we were able to reach consensus regarding the importance of having the country starting with their national plans, national plans for family farming. And the decade is an instance for reflection around the importance of family farming for the economic development, social and environmental development in the region, and the organization of policies for family farming in our countries. We can now say that after a year and a half, many of the countries in the region are already working on their family farming plans. And in our case, we have finalized and we are now under going the implementation of the plan, even though later on there will be a presentation by Manuel Maldini regarding the progress that has been achieved. Definitely, there is so much to do and so many things to do to promote this sector, ranging from uh, value chains, access to markets, diversification, adding value in production, and other challenges that the world is posing regarding the different requirements related to consumption and others. And without a doubt, family farmers have to be looking at that with close attention. The challenge of adaptation to climate change that impacts all inhabitants of all the countries, particularly family farmers, farmers and the need for creating more attractive agendas for the youth that is another priority because we need to involve the youth into family farming. We need to encourage younger people to stay 
in rural areas and also consolidating the progress in terms of closing the gaps, especially for rural women, and of course, to create institutional frameworks, both in the private and public sector to promote multifunctionality of family farming from REAF, the specialized meeting, we have so much to cooperate with. We have so much to learn from other subregions, and certainly only with strong partnerships, only with productive dialogues, we will be able to set the pathway to give answer to the entire sector of family farming. So we are at your service and happy to continue with the exchange of experiences regarding what we've been doing in the region. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado, and thank you, and congratulations for the pro temporary chair that you are leading. And we will hear more from that experience regarding the national plan and all the work that you've been doing for all the countries of REAF and Mercosur. And now, to start with the assessment of what we've been doing in the region in regards to the implementation of the decade and also to address the challenges of the agenda. I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Luis Veduski from the regional office from the regional office of FAO and also responsible for family farming. And he will be addressing uh, that issue regarding the decade of uh, family farming in Latin America and the Caribbean. Buenas tardes a todas, a todos. Debe dar un gran gusto. Thank you, Pedro. It's really nice to have you all here with us, Fernanda, Lucrecia, Melissa, Lautaro, Maria Noel, and everybody else here that is in the chat. I have a, presen a presentation here to make it easier for the for the um, conversation, and I would like to start with the idea that three of these comments that the colleagues made, first of all, um, Pedro and also the regional director talked about the importance of the participation in the civil society organizations. And that is indeed something that from the FAO and as a technical secretariat of the decade with the FIDA, we are uh, taken seriously. And we are also glad to have the participation of the civil society. We're always requesting to have that participation. Also, uh, what Fernanda was saying, you're going to see that here in this talent. We have Uruguay, we uh, are going to continue doing this exchange. We have used the experience from Uruguay with Mercedes, with Fernando and others. But what we want to do is something that called my attention to try to uh, work better in the political instruments. And I think that this helps us in this very brief reflection, starting on this decade view of resignifying, of having a new perspective on what it means to be a farmer to be a family farmer. And this is a world that changes very fast. This is an excellent platform to be able to highlight this role that the farmers carry out in the eradication of hunger, in the eradication of poverty, and in the construction of our future. It is not by chance that the Global Alliance Against Hunger and Poverty puts in their priorities the work with family and agriculture, because this offers a, a unique opportunity to guarantee nutritional um, aspects and manage 
natural resources in a better way. And finally, have a sustained development in the rural areas. The decade also uh, recognizes, the FAO also recognizes in a very direct way, the role that the agricultures have as key uh, players in change. Change is not going to happen externally. This is something that is related to putting in evidence the role that the family farmers have as change agents, always when there are coherent uh, pol public policies that allow to even things out and for everybody to be able to have a role in the development no of their own uh, territory. So having family farmer at the center of development, this is something that we talk about in the decade. So here, the decade was the first launch in the Dominican Republic where we got the declaration of Bávaro. Then we met in Santiago, in Chile, as Fernanda was saying, in the Latin American and Caribbean uh, meeting of family, farmer, uh, family farmers and also the uh, Mercosur family farmer. Farmers Association. So uh, Uruguay gave to Chile the power to organize this meeting. And then we got the Declaration of Santiago, where we uh, got committed to have an action plan of the RIAFI for the uh, decade. And the SICA region also uh, has a plan for the decade for the decade, and we also reinforce the willingness that we have to put at, uh, at the disposal of whoever may need it, our cooperation for other parts of the world. Our figures are very powerful. We have 10 countries out of the 33 with uh, action plans that are under development, two uh, under uh, regional, sub-regional plans, and more than 60 experiences that are systematized and shared in spaces such as this one, where we had more than 20,000 people in different activities of dialogue and information that have the decisive this has a uh, support of the several organizations of civil society that are here. So what are we going to continue doing? Here we have this look forward that uh, talks about what is next in this five years of the decade. We uh, start identifying priorities and needs in this dialogue spaces, and we want to start building um, positions, generating evidence, knowledge about practices, about instruments that can effectively uh, support the sector of family farming. And finally, strengthen capabilities. So uh, making uh, the knowledge grow and implement this differentiated actions. Here we have the interaction spaces, interregional spaces as well, that are extremely important regionally. For example, the plan, the San Select plan, that takes many of the foods that were accumulated in the RIAFI and also in the Sica region, we add here the onion uh, community of regions, the CARICOM, in an agenda that is related to the decade um, plans, generating evidence and fostering policy dialogue, and also uh, recommending public policies that are more efficient, strengthening capabilities, and something that is very important, put at the disposal the, uh, the role that we have as a change agent that is focused on the development plan. So finally, we are going to be committed on this. It is not by chance that we have this activity here. We also work with the regional platform uh, for family agriculture. We are fostering this connection 
in this uh, five platforms that the fellow has. And this region was chosen to lead the family agriculture platform. So we are going to continue doing this with uh, more and more intensity, Fernanda and colleagues, and colleagues who are going to be knocking at your, or your doors so, you, so that you can contribute in those spaces and we can have virtual spaces for exchange and also practice de conocimiento a partir de los cuales and we can start um, fostering la participación the participation de la of family farming in a more intense manner in the spaces eh, que son tan that are very important in the 2030, uh, 2030 agenda. So thank you very much for nosotros, your willingness to participate with us. I want to thank Lautaro as well, Technical Secretariat of the RIAFI that is here with us today. And I wish that you have a good reflection and that we can uh, reinforce the role of family agriculture. Thank you for that update. And for this great uh, idea of what is coming forward. And as Luis said, and as we have mentioned many times, the implementation of the decade here in the region was always hand in hand with the integration, the regional integration, not on, not ever as something individual, but as the construction of regional reflection, starting from dialogue and from cooperation. And it was possible to disseminate this information and build a consensus about, about priorities and other things that would uh, give us information about the territory. So to be able to get to know more about the processes and look at the uh, different results and priorities and challenges for the future, we are going to have the next three blocks that are going to talk about the integration spaces in Central America. And I would like to thank all of the team of CECAC that has been here with us in the preparation of this space and they have facilitated a, a, as well the process of invitations and all of that so the idea is that from the CICAD we can uh, with a dialogue plan and from the Dominican Republic in, in representation of the countries how we have been working the CICA uh, region and Melissa you can have the floor and after that we are going to have Anola and Miriam. Thank you very much, Pedro. I just wanted to confirm that you are seeing my screen. It's not in presentation mode. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank you all uh, from my department. We're all very um, proud to be able to be here sharing with you the experiences, the challenges and the lessons learned that we have had in the implementation of this decade of family uh, farming. Now about the Sika region, as you can see here in the presentation in the last years, we have been working in the construction of a sub-regional plan of the decade, identifying those challenges that are present in the region to be able to address those situations that can be presented in family agriculture. From 2014, we worked on the construction of this process to finish in 2022 with the approval of the sub-regional plan. We ended with the ministries, uh, the ministers of the uh, of the region. We have been working on different initiatives and we have had, we have been making um, important progress, especially in technical analysis, in regulations in family agriculture, in um, capacity training uh, for family farmers. We have worked on the access and on the access to a short cycle, national and regionally, 
we have been training in terms of how to deal with those market, the normative regulation in food safety, and the link, the link with family agriculture has been something important to recognize. We need to see this as a key actor, as a key player to make sure that we have the boost of the economical aspect of the territories. We have been working through the implementation of the sub-regional plan, but also in the framework of our uh, normative rules, normative uh, instruments, the policy of, uh, of indigenous people and Afro-descendants our uh, people that we work with in our programs, the policy of uh, nutritional aspects in the, in the Sika region has been reinforcing this work that we do in the different uh, access availability that we have for food. Um, we also talked about the uh, rural use in this sub-regional framework and also in the framework of our um, of our frameworks of use. We have been strengthening this aspect in the different territories so that more and more they, they can have opportunities and they can stay uh, in those territories. As rural women, we have always uh, also been working on the strengthening of capabilities in training and also uh, giving those opportunities uh, regionally, and also we have been working on climate change, resiliency, where agricultures are those of the sectors that are more affected in this event. In the main challenges, and as we have been mentioning before, we have those priorities and we have developed um, we have indicated uh, the countries, we are working on this with, the, with those countries in this 10-year uh, period. We want to work with uh, people and with women and men and uh, youth. We want to give them access to, uh, to different places where they can see uh, market intelligence, when we can put together, um, put them together with family farmers and and all of this, uh, all of those uh, differentiated aspects that will allow them to have better credit condi uh, conditions, um, seed capital insurance, and also the support for the collectiveness. We want to strengthen the capability to access um, technologies, adaptation to climate change, uh, valuation of um, livelihoods, agroalimentary um, systems, making them more sustainable socially and uh, economically speaking, and also the articulation of all of the different sectors. However, we always have challenges in the region that we need to work on. For example, the uh, poverty reduction, uh, gap reduction, uh, ethnical um, discrimination reduction, illegal economies. And here we talk about the access to the access to land that affect the territory so much. So uh, young people and also women mainly. We want to uh, uh, try to keep the young people in their territories and avoid migration. Also, the differences between the rural and the, um, the urban sectors are very marked. We have been seeing that the climate change has been affecting us for a long time. Lately. In the region, we have uh, certain improvements and also achievements that we have made. And I would like to give the floor to the key players that we have in our region. Um, I know that Miriam Guzman, Vice Ministry of the uh, Agricultural Ministry in the, in the uh, Dominican Republic. They're going to tell us about the progress that we have been making and what challenges we have for the next five years. Thank you. 
Gracias, Melissa, y de inmediato pasaría la palabra. Thank you, Melissa. Para que no I know that the floor no is yours. Diálogo Rural Regional. ¿no? She Hola, comes Melissa, from a eh, un socio clave que Diálogo Rural. De de These are que a key partners, partners that we have in Latin America and the Caribbean. Buenos días y gracias por la oportunidad. Good morning and thank you very much for the opportunity. I am going to talk about the uh, Dialogue uh, Rural Regional um, in uh, the civil society program. We have 22 organizations in Central America and the Dominican Republic. We have been working on this process before uh, the 10th year, the, the 10 years, and we continue working on this. One of the achievements that we have um, identified, and we know that they are part of the CICA support in the government is what is related to the acknowledgement of the policy, the public policies that are differentiated. Not all of the countries in the region have the law. Some of us are more advanced than others, but we do have a law that identifies family agriculture. Family agriculture has achieved a certain vis visibility because we didn't have it before. So there's a certain visibility on what is family agriculture in the region. In this process, this has contributed to improving the quality of life and, and some product producers and also their families. And it also contributes to having more solidarity in the groups. We have organized and we have more opportunity and more potential to be able to negotiate with the government and with also the national and international government. This is something that uh, we can achieve as a group. We have that opportunity that has allowed us to do this. Family agriculture in general has a diversification of products because it is not monocrop. So that is one of the advantages that we have in family agriculture as we can diversify the production and that can contribute to resiliency and climate change. Bueno, dentro de los logros también está la parte del registro de la agricultura familiar. Within the achievements, no se also there is a registry, even though it has not been finalized, but it started to know with certainty how many family farmers there are in the region, even though all the countries have not done it yet, and those that have have still not finalize the process, but it is ongoing. So that would be part of the achievements. Regarding the challenges, even though there is a law and there are differentiated policies, we know that the challenges are also in finding access to credit. And also access to credit is basically related to land ownership and the access that the farmer has to be owner of the land. And within the challenges, technical assistance, and also stepping into the world of technology, we need family farmers to use the existing technology to improve the productivity and the production. To acknowledge that due to the way of working, the little use of agrochemicals, family farming contributes to climate change resilience because the family farmer does not use agrochemicals many times because they aren't even able to afford agrochemicals. They're not using it in their production. And within the process, we are trying to incorporate, of course, uh, added value to the products. Within the challenges, it has to be said, we have subordinated selling to large national and transnational companies. And that also affects the market of family farmers. And also the displacement of some farmers due to mining activities 
y el de cielo abierto y and el open que pit eso mining and also hydroelectric plants that are translated into family farmers moving, being displaced. Certain opportunities that we see into the future are first acknowledging that as family farmers, they are making a contribution towards fighting climate change and therefore a greater percentage of the funds. The green funds should also be channeled to family farmers. That would be a great opportunity for family farmers if they were able to have those funds. Also, the institutional strengthening to to promote and to boost family farming and in the rural dialogue program, we are working on that so that as an organization, we are able to grow stronger and to have greater access to resources to support the different organizations and also engage with other organizations. And something else that has been mentioned already is to prioritize the contribution of women and the youth. We know that within family farming, most of the people that are doing this work are over 50 years old. So it is important to have this uh, generational renewal to contribute to future farming because we know that family farming facilitates the economic and social development of the population. It avoids rural to city migration, and also it avoids international migration. I think I'd like to leave it at that. I don't know how many minutes I have left, but still, these are the opportunities that we have, and we know that there are challenges and opportunities out there, and we are definitely open to hear all the opportunities that would help us overcome risk and challenges. Thank you, Inola. Now I'd like to give the floor to Miriam Guzman from the Dominican Republic for her to give her perspective from the government and from the SICA region regarding the achievements and the opportunities that have been achieved. Not only there are challenges, there are also opportunities. Mrs. Miriam, please, the floor is yours. From the moment we started four years ago with this process, with a new change in the administration, I think that the first step was to give follow-up to what had been the process of the beginning of the decade of family farming. Based on that, we started strengthening the Minister of Rural Development or the Vice Minister, the Vice Ministry of Rural Development that by decree is until the year 21 in which it becomes legally valid as a Vice Ministry that gave us the opportunity in a valid manner to participate in the following processes in which we have promoted the family farming bill of law that at the moment is in the Congress. It has been approved by the House of Representatives and now awaiting the approval of the Senate the decree 610 that makes it mandatory to have an intersectorial approach among a number of entities that are directly related to production, market, healthcare, etc., regarding the production of small and mid-sized farmers. And it also makes it mandatory for the public procurement sector. And for me, that's one of the greatest opportunity to acquire at least 5% or to buy 5% of what they need from family farmers. With all those elements, we have been working directly 
towards contributing first with a process of associations. We believe that it is key for small and mid-sized producers to actually be involved in the market for them. All the internal processes were made more flexible in order to identify and to formalize the participation of people in cooperatives. Specific programs that had been carried out by the FAO in the Republic were integrated. We worked with the Vice Ministry of Rural Development to give a follow-up to what we have called Casa Sombra, which are smaller protected space in which, with the use of technology, smaller farmers, men and women, are able to be involved, involved in the highly profitable production process, making this a more professionalized entity and also supplying uh, foods for the school system and also taking advantage of the increasing touristic industry and also using that opportunity, we involved not only the agricultural organizations as well as others, like the organization Superate, we have also included touristic areas and there is a national hotels association and we are working so that smaller, tiny, tiny producers, especially younger people and women using technology are able to become involved in the direct market of sales to the hotels. That is what we are working for. That is what we are working towards, and we are now uh, working to educate and to train people around everything related to food security so that the producers can take the opportunities of openness and access to ports, airports, and also new uh, hotels as well as in the south and other regions. We have worked with the Family Farming Council, we are working in the Group for Rural Development, and we are working on an intersectional approach in an effort to have each entity or institution of the Dominican state that is in what way or an, in one way or another related to the productive sector to be a part of a comprehensive uh, working group towards, an towards a strategic plan. The challenges ahead of us are huge. The first one is the intersectorial approach and many times to let go of this budget constraints to do any type of an activity. And in that sense, it is key to move forward because one of the key challenges is the well-being that the smaller farmers need to live in to make it feasible for people to actually want to stay in the rural areas and furthermore that they go back to rural areas and that they are safe or that they are people that preserve that traditional knowledge because it's only farmers that produce food and the farmers need to make a living off of that and they need to remain there and they need to protect their production. However, to the extent that production is good for the producer and if it doesn't work anymore, they want to leave to the city because they want to enjoy the quality of life that the city offers. Therefore, in order to have food security, there needs to be well-being for rural families. Therefore, in the Dominican Republic, it is a public works 
that need to pave the roads. It is the healthcare sector that needs to have primary care available. The Ministry of Education needs to be able to supply transportation so that young children down the road that is built by the Minister of Public Works are able to go to school. The children of the farmers and sometimes more kilometers of roads that are in very poor conditions are preventing children from attending school or attending higher education. And therefore, sometimes they are illiterate or functional illiterate when the building of the road with a bus available would have given them the opportunity to attend a university without having to move to the cities. So this is a huge challenge, intersectorial work and also well-being in the rural areas because that well-being is what will make the difference between people staying and leaving. And to that well-being, we have to add the talent of access to financing and access to technology, because without technology, the young people will not be able to work on this. And we have to teach our smaller farmers the smallest farmers in little plots of land that they can still be highly productive if we were to meet their demands, if we were to give somehow added value to what we produce. And that is why we need to engage in partnerships so that it's cooperatives that make or that take the first step of added value and that producers are able to see that they can continue to produce, but from the added value and the trade, they can also obtain the benefits that it gives. And because of that, we have been working along the process to engage in partnerships. We have been working on the intersectorial collaborations, and we have taken advantage of the opportunities given to us by touristic growth. And the FAO has played a key role in the intersectorial collaboration process. And precisely at the moment, we are undergoing a process of update and modernization of the agricultural world in which family farming plays a key role definitely, and that is for the purpose of sustainability, growth, and support to this vice ministry from the highest government levels so that the plans can actually be executed and having smaller rural farmers to have maybe not the same opportunities, but that the gap is closed the gap between the smaller and the larger farmers in terms of access to financing and technology. I believe that that is the effort that we are making. The farmers will have their opportunity to take the floor and they will be able to say what has been done so far, being aware of the fact that there is still a long way to go, definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miriam. Now I'd like to close with Melissa, please. Once again, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much for that. Now I'd like to give the floor to Melissa, please. Hi, I think that there's someone that has their microphone on, maybe. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you once again. Thank you, Inola, Miriam. Thank you for that. I think it's been very educational regarding the actions that have been happening in the region and the challenges that we still have ahead of us. As I mentioned earlier, I'd like to make a few contributions as a conclusion in the framework of the work that has 
has been conducted in the region in the framework of the sub-regional plan that after it was approved has as an objective to be the framework of regional reference to guide the actions towards the strengthening of the sector of family farming because it needs it and that it allows us to do a follow-up of the different initiatives that are put in place at the level of the territories and that we are able to have an exchange of experiences from the national contact points that is so needed in the territories of the region. One could say as a conclusion that in the last five years, we've been able to make huge progress in terms of capacity building for smaller farmers, promoting the creation of the regulatory frameworks and public policies that are customized, that are supporting the family the farmers in the region. One of the points of uh, advancement has been promoting the integration of family farmers into the value chains, facilitating their access to different markets nationally as well as internationally or regionally. Furthermore, several countries have implemented their training and educational programs in sustainable, resilient agricultural practices. And because of that, that has allowed the farmers to improve their techniques and to increase their performance, thus reducing the vulnerability of their crops. All these efforts have promoted productive diversification, promoting the production of more nutritive, more sustainable foods for local consumption. And also we continue moving forward to promote family farming as a key sector for food security and that generation of rural employment for the youth, for rural women and for neglected populations, highlighting the importance of the sustainable development goal as it has been mentioned before by Mr. Mrs. Miriam and Mrs. Inola. Even though there has been progress in the region, there continues to be opportunities to work on family farming in the context of the sub-regional plan of the decade, in our case for the Sika region, both at the national and at the regional level. And there are definitely challenges in the implementation of differentiated policies, as it has been mentioned to promote the comprehensive development of the sector and also the establishment of the records of family farming, which is something that we have been working on for a number of years now, and that we hope to be able to finalize at the end of the decade of family farming and with the participation of the communities in the decision-making process, we have to promote that participation even more of civil society in the decision-making process and some of the factors that we have mentioned so far are the factors that make it more difficult to actually consolidate an enabling context for family farm. To overcome these challenges, we think that it is important to foster an inclusive approach that will um, take into consideration these particularities and also guarantees uh, sustainability in family agriculture. So I think that we have a long way to go, not just in the region, but also in Latin America. And we, from the uh, from our department, we are more and more committed with the work that we are doing for the family farmers in our region. Thank you very much. It is important to say uh, to, to mention this integration that we are doing with the PDRR in the uh, different countries that reinforces intersectoriality. We need to reinforce certain messages to reposition family agriculture in other spaces, for example, in the ministries, uh, um, in the ministries of meetings and other things that you do in the SICA. I think that this intersectoriality that has been reinforced, this brings us many, many um, realities, not just our 
course from Latin America and the Caribbean, but also we can see how we can connect our solutions with other different uh, spaces in the world. And also in the light of those achievements, we have the experience of uh, dialogue and participation, social participation that we have for the policy construction, where we have had several um, advances in the Mercosur, but also in the uh, other regions, in the other countries. This is uh, the mechanism for feedback at a national level and vice versa. And also from the countries, we are feeding this agenda. So Lautaro, I am going to give you the floor as a technical secretariat so that you can uh, conduct this this uh, part with uh, Mariela from Paraguay. Thank you very much, Pedro, and all of you, all of the participants, the ones that are listening and participating in the chat. It is also very important to have this kind of exchange. Many things have been said. I am going to take five minutes, and then I am going to uh, listen to, um, to Daniela and Mariela. I wanted to uh, talk about a point that Luis started uh, referring to. For us, it is very important to re-signify, as Luis was saying, uh, family agriculture. And why is that? Undoubtedly, re-signifying family agriculture post-pandemic agriculture with everything that has been going on, the big um, global tensions and the effects that we had in climate change, uh, the war itself, and many other difficulties that we have been dealing with in our community uh, and we have been dealing with globally in the last five years. Resignifying the role of family agriculture allows us to open a space to rethink the policies and to rethink um, what it means to innovate, innovation in public policies for what we have left in this decade. And the REAF in the Mercosur, in this case, this meant an important strategy to be able to rethink what we had been doing and re-signify what we had done well, but what we needed to scale. For example, there were some situations that for us were key in the registries of family agriculture, as Inola said, the, the importance of having the records allow for that connection in with the different instruments. And now with the a decade, as Miriam said, the intersectoriality, looking at this intergovernment, what is happening with this sector? Uh, we are resignifying because this answers many of the problems that we have in our society in terms of food and poverty and hunger. So for us, the records have been um, an opportunity to resignify things and to invest effectively which is absolutely important to orient public policies and the design of new public policies. So for the REAF, uh, we have been um, resignifying policies that we had in the first cycle, in the first decade, and put them in value from a, a perspective into the future. As Fernando Maldonado said, the letter of Santiago meant a commitment from the different governments. For the REAF, it was very healthy to meet in the regional um, agricultural meeting in FAO because that allowed to tune regionally this calling of South-South cooperation. Can we share? Can we eliminate the transaction costs? How do we implement the policy? And this means to accelerate changes, to accelerate public policies, and to be able to innovate as we were doing it before. I think that in there we have a qualitative leap, that it is important in all of the process that we have, in all of the pillars. And starting from the Santiago letter, from the letter of Santiago, the Mercosur, 
uh, established that they needed a plan, a regional plan, but also connect this plan with the uh, needs of the different countries that integrate the uh, Mercosur and the REAP and the uh, extended Mercosur. There is something that I would like to talk about, which is the political dialogue, which was the big element which uh, by which the uh, Mercosur uh, could turn 20 years in, in work. This is in a democratic framework, in a plural um, area. In these 20 years, we or they have been able to maintain this dialogue amongst the different organizations with the responsible people from public policies in the different countries. And this has been one of the mechanisms that we have been able to resignify. The uh, decade shows us that this is something good that is going to keep on being good for what is coming next. And we need to understand that social innovation as Mariela and other organizations are uh, key allies for innovation in public policies that are differentiated uh, for the process. And the political dialogue allows us to do that. It allows us to cover in a way, to protect in a way, this uh, opportunity to innovate and co-innovate so that we can have more and better public policies. Undoubtedly, this is going to impact on policies and norms and regulations. We have been seeing the, uh, the evolution there, and there are adapted to the realities of each one of the countries. So it's something that we do not talk much about, but at a budget level, we realized uh, that this enabled us to increase this uh, this communication with the governments and with others. So we can also um, see uh, other organizations of the state that are related to electrification, to water access, to infrastructure in general, uh, education, and the possibility of connectivity in the field. So the decade, it, it is, of course, an opportunity for resignifying what we were already doing. But it is also an opportunity to innovate. If we uh, were doubting about the importance of innovating, the importance about talking about a digitalization or the type of technical assistance that we needed, today I think this is an open door, uh, an honest door that we can use to talk because there is visibility that the sector is important for fighting hunger and it is important to to maintain the territories alive, dynamic, and be able to really use the territory with the different rural communities. My possibility to broaden this is to exemplify what Manuel is going to be talking about, which is a case, a concrete case, and it is a case that is being implemented. And also say that maybe Manuel is going to go through that fast, but he's going to mention it. The case of Uruguay is repeated in many countries. For Uruguay, we have a commission for follow-up that is made up by uh, organizations of family, uh, family farmers. They are in charge of uh, making things work, and it was designed uh, to be like that along with the organizations of family agriculture in Uruguay. Tomorrow, uh, Mariela, right, we're going to be um, presenting in Paraguay. I know that we're working on an asset that it is an intangible, that is it is alive, it is a shared agenda, an agenda that has been tuned up. Brazil is also advancing their plan, also Chile, and all of their, all of you, the countries have the different agendas, have the different times, and they're all advancing in their national plans. There is a huge vocation in the FAO and uh, of CCAP to be able to collaborate and to broaden the alliances, to broaden the political um, dialogue, and also take best experiences to, and also bad experiences to all of the places so that we all can learn uh, technicians, uh, people from the uh, government, and we can all share our, our experience. There was a technical uh, process, a, a 
of a training process. And it is very easy to talk to the technicians of government. We all know about the design. The pillars are well known. This is already part of the knowledge. And this was something that seemed impossible a couple of years ago. Today, we can talk to Manuel, to Skanga, to Juanita, and everybody knows what we're talking about. This is a very important asset for the next policies and the next agendas that are coming uh, in the way. So uh, thank you very much. We are going to be seeing you in November, as Pedro was saying, and I hope I, we have uh, some good experiences today. Thank you very much, Lautaro. Manuel. I can project Perfecto, from here. Gracias, Pedro. Bueno, Thank you, Pedro. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I was listening to uh, my colleagues. And well, we want to show the your YM case. This can be an experience that is good for the next for the rest of the countries. The plan for national agriculture Uruguay we think it's important to centralize how Uruguay is in family agriculture. Here we see how important this is. There are 80,000 people linked in the country in family production, and in some areas, this is even more important. For example, the agricultural production. A 58% of the products from, come from uh, family producers. And a 15% of the, uh, this is 15% uh, of the total uh, production in the country. So what is going on in Uruguay? As in many other countries, we have seen a reduction in this figure of family farmers, and that makes us think that we need to make some changes. And well, we hope that the National Plan of Family Agriculture can collaborate in this change. In the case of youth, the truth is that uh, there isn't much participation in the rural world. And we would like to change this with more opportunities available. We cannot responsibilize a plan for generating all of these changes that are necessary for family agriculture. We hope that all countries can collaborate to generate the changes that are needed in this aspect. We're going to go through this very fast. The National Plan of Family Agriculture in Uruguay is presented in June 2024. And there was also the question of how, why losing half a decade? And there is an influence of COVID in general in that plan and in the spaces. But starting from the letter of Santiago that was already mentioned by Dr. Mal, by Dr. Maldonado, and also the recommendation of boosting the national plans, we started uh, having these plans, these national plans for family agriculture, with the particularity that the plan included the years 2024-2028, where Uruguay has certain elections this year is an election year for us, and there's a change of administration next year, so that means that the plans for family agriculture culture have a, a need, an extra need, because of the eventual change of administration. And that highlights the opportunity of what Lautaro was saying, having the organizations of family agriculture sustaining all of these plans. And I would also add the, the workers 
um, supporting these plans. This is something that we are going to see repeated, mainly in the way of carrying out the plans, which is basically what we would like to do. We are not going to go deep in terms of the plan, but we're going to leave you a link here so that you can check it. We were interested in you knowing the process in this case. This is the methodology that we used for the construction of the national plan in Uruguay. This is based partially in the methodology used in another plan, which is the national plan of gender, where, well, we start with a framework agreement, with the resolution of the authorities, we uh, hear about who can participate, and we uh, set the meeting of the REAP as the space of the civil society. Many times the productor, the productors' organizations say, we are not a civil society. We are a civil society that is qualified or involved in a certain way. So here, everybody has the opportunity to participate. And here I want to take what Lautaro was saying about the importance of their presence and the importance of having at the beginning of the plan a national selection of the REAF that is strong and that works well. So promoted by the institutions, but with a good representative representation, we check the background and we start checking the process from scratch. We are not going to generate uh, all of it, all of the report there. We just need to validate if the reports are uh, are updated. Here we had 21 technicians that carried out this revision. Each one of the steps that we're going to see, the background, the, the requests and everything has the participation or at least the validation of family agriculture. So with this diagnosis, we are going to go to um, a citizen consultation process where those technicians that check the processes plus the focal points and also in the interior of the country through the technicians, we are going to have um, citizen consultations where in each place, by each area, with each one of the pillars, we are going to make proposals about, about what are the measures to take to have a good family plan. After all of these measures, that we're going to see, we're going to do a prioritization of those requests, and then we are going to go through the construction of measures. And so taking everything that we already had as support, our policies of support are, are going to be increased. So this could be something that already existed, but because of the need that we had to increase it in magnitude or, or in other, the idea was not to take everything that was already done and generate a plan with things that already existed. So this was a document, and at the end, we have a revision and a, a revision of all of this plan. The uh, construction of this plan, we needed to agree and respect with all of the uh, regulations. We needed to contemplate what was uh, socially pertaining and that was contemplated by the authorities. They signed the commitment to uh, advance with this. And they also needed to have indicators that allowed to measure their compliance and impact. And of course, they needed to have a commitment of action or uh, funding. Some information about this construction process 
We, here we see all of the citizen consultation. We have 53 instances of citizen consultation where we had more than 1,100 people with more than 1,200 proposals that uh, some received uh, answers from 40 institutions. From the agricultural and not agricultural areas. These 1,200 proposals that were generated are there pending for um, different plans. So here we only uh, see the ones that are um, going to be. This comes from the um, from the people that are interested, the former, the farmers, and the civil society. The logic of the creation, well, it is based on an assessment, and I'm sure that in many of the countries, there have been a number of assessments regarding the situation of family farming. From the proposals, we set the priorities from the family farming organizations, and then we looked at how to do the negotiation process with those leading each of the public institutions. And from that, we started putting in place certain incremental actions to create a plan from here to 2028, with the caveat that every year, because of this situation of a change in the administration that will happen next year, each year has a yearly operational plan in which the government, the state, of course, in communication with the family farming organizations, is able to put in place a growth action uh, for the plans. However, the plan has a baseline or a minimum set. And for us as a team, we are trying to call this as a planned uh, flexibility. So for instance, what we are able to do in one year with a certain budget that has been approved in the event of the change in administration is this or that. And from that situation, it would be desirable that each yearly operational plan was built on top of the previous year. You have five minutes left. Great, I think I will take even less than that. The important part here in this moment, in this situation of a change of administration, is that, well, that the governance of the plan is implemented and said because there was a direction for the plan that was basically the national coordination for REAF. At the moment, Dr. Fernanda Maldonado and others, and also a technical coordination team that is comprised by Fernando Ganga, Paula Florip. Lautaro, Vizcay, myself, and others, and also from the institutions, I mean, technical uh, reference points to follow up with the different goals. And then we have the follow-up commission that Lautaro mentioned from the civil society. It says that it should say representatives from the organizations of family farming and also an interinstitutional commission that allows us to remain updated with the actions in the three last instances, the technical points of reference, the follow-up commission, the interinstitutional commission, are the ones that we believe that as a country will serve as the uh, as the uh, long-term sustenance of the family farming plans, and this will start from the potential changes that we discussed earlier. Now, through the work that I have shared with you very quickly. 
but still feel free to ask any questions you may have. But from these efforts, this document was created, and this is the National Plan for Family Farming in Uruguay. If you scan the QR code or if you Google it, you may have access to the entire document with the assessments, the actions that were put in place, and it is very interesting. And there are other documents of policies that were already existing, but were not part of the plan. And there's plenty of information. We find it very rich, and it is sort of a general snapshot regarding the policies for family farming in the country that were not necessarily included in the plan. And there is an introduction, the methodology that I explained earlier, and each of the pillars with the assessment, also the planning for 2024-28 with 52 incremental measures. I think that's an interesting number. And of course, there are many topics that are covered here. And the yearly operational plan by 2024, and hopefully at the end of 2024, the 2025 plan will be uh, put in place for that uh, planned flexibility that I mentioned earlier. And lastly, the implementation strategy, follow-up governance assessment. And that is what we're doing today when the final document of the plan will be drafted. And right now we are undergoing the execution and the follow-up of the 52 measures. And there has been progress in many of those. Some of them have been executed already, executed completely. And that is the work that we've been doing now from the technical teams and the coordinator team. And of course, without the support of the different teams, it would be impossible to keep up with all the actions that we have in place. I'm so sorry, can you please go back to the previous one? It would be important to highlight here. Can you please move back? Thank you. The plan beyond the effort that we are engaging in. This is related to, first, the fact that we have authorities that are willing to promote such a plan. As I said, at secondly, there are technical people and officials that are committed to promoting family farming, organizations of the civil society and family farming that are representing different stakeholders and representing different geographic regions, and they are committed to this. We always insist they're not coming here to propose things that we know that will not happen within the time frame of four years. They are serious enough to propose and to ask for things that are achievable. And in that sense, that allowed us to reach a plan that was agreed upon. And also the national the national organization that is strong, that is working, that is highly representative and beyond the measures that we will see later that are divided into different pillars. The, the presentation of the plan is one of the actions in itself. And I'd like to go back to what Lautaro mentioned earlier in that to give visibility to family farming is important, to put the topic on the table, to have everyone talk about it, and to generate articulation and interaction engagements with other institutions of the agricultural policies and other policies as part of the institutionality. Most likely, those entities were not as close to the area of uh, family farm farming. They were not aware of how to generate differentiated policies and starting from the plan that institutionality related or not to agricultural activities allows us to engage in that articulation and to promote whatever can be done. How long do I have? Uh, how much time do I have left, please? 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds, actually. Well, now, these are the seven pillars of the decade 
for the design of the plans. In Uruguay, we did have to make some adjustments in terms of which topics were going to be included within each pillar. The seven pillars remained in the titles and the content mostly, and I'm sure that it happened for other countries that uh, that they needed to adjust the pillars. So we do have the seven pillars. I will not read through everything. Let's move on to the following slide, please. And this is the structure of each of the 52 actions. We will not go over this because all the slides that follow will be made available to you by the, or, the organization. And also, if you use the link or QR code that we send you when we were talking about the family farming plan, you will see each one of the actions and each one of the institutions that are responsible and the deadlines, the goals for the first year, for the yearly operational plan 2024. And this was just a way to show you the 52 different measures for you to have that in consideration to be able to analyze that with more time. I'd like to move forward. I would say that that there are 10 slides with the different measures that we are going to be putting in place. And I'd like to go over that. Now, taking the time that we have all the government institutions or state institutions that are here, and some of those that are not necessarily state institutions, but that are part of the family farming plan. That's why I wanted to mention again, there's a need for having this articulation and working with family farming in a way that is in articulation, because each one of the institutions did have a certain action to benefit family farming or that promoted that, but some of those did not have the necessary elements, for instance, to define family farming, to keep a record of that, how to give benefits to family farming, and this plan allows to do that. And we believe that these types of plans will help us transform the policies into state policies instead of isolated individual efforts. I think, Pedro, I'd like to leave it at that. That's all I had to share with you. And that is what we wanted to share regarding the creation of the family farming plan in Uruguay. Thank you so much. I'd like to give the floor now to Mariela. It's been an interesting process regarding having a dialogue and making decisions to guide the actions. This is a process in which dialogue became institutionalized, and that is a huge achievement beyond the concrete results in terms of policies like the plan itself. This is an institutionalization of dialogue. It is a creation of something that brings us so many reflections and so many uh, thoughts about how to facilitate the process in our countries and in the region overall. And in that framework, it's been a very interesting experience of REAF. And the farmers are playing a key role. And Mariela comes from the association in Paraguay and also representing other stakeholders of REAF in the last years. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pedro. Good afternoon, dear participants. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation to refer to the topic. As a woman, as a representative of Paraguay, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Lautaro, and thank you to the entire commission. And thank you to everyone joining us today. Uh, 
And thank you for the opportunity. I am learning so many things in this little time because our commission of agroecology is the newest one. However, we communicate through a WhatsApp group in which we are always staying up to date. And one of the first things that I learned was precisely the decade of family farming, 10 years that would seem to be a lot, they are over in 2028, and that is just around the corner. We are halfway there, as one says. And REAF turned 20 years, and precisely it matched with the contemporary presidency of my country in June last year, and that was very successful. This means that two decades ago, we have had or we started having a huge instance for family farming for rural for indigenous farming this is an instance to meet with representatives of organizations or to meet with governments with government representatives to draft a common agenda and also to share with other farmers to share experiences and to share to share knowledge which is valuable for the food production this is a huge step and i'd like to mention that we have over 15 centers and also recommendations for public procurement gender, rural youth, food safety, trade, as well as other issues. And I'd like to share with you that during the REAF that took place in Rio, where I participated for the first time as the point of reference from Paraguay, uh, we worked in one project for recommendations for agroecology and God willing, it will be more than just a recommendation. It will become a true action and exchange between countries that will be very fruitful for everyone. And on top of all of this, as of this year, we finally have in the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock in my country, one organization that will be uh, responsible for working in the agroecological issue as the technical counterpart and this is a very important step and the REAF gave us support gave us uh, support to achieve this as we say here in Paraguay in Guarani it gives us a bidin in the Guarani word which is something that makes us very proud to develop a work that is highly targeted and in general terms as a person that knows the land and the work with young uh, farmers, we can definitely say that there has been progress in terms of family farming in certain countries. And of course, in certain countries, uh, things move along at a faster pace, and in other countries, things move along at a slower pace. And that is why REAF is very important for everyone that produces food for the region, for our countries, and for the world, because it allows allows us to make our voices heard. It allows us to express our demands and also our strengths to leave no one behind, as the FAO says, because the FAO says that we should not leave, we shouldn't leave anyone behind, right? We have to work together at all times. And I always hear and I feel it as a farmer, as a woman, and as a mother, I feel that we still have difficulties, there are still hurdles and gaps in terms of access to the market, and also in terms of the technology that moves along so quickly, and also gaps in terms of uh, access to land and land ownership, and on top of that the changes in the weather patterns that we feel not only in our region but everywhere in the world. So the REAF is one opportunity as the colleagues mentioned earlier, the REAF is actually an opportunity for us to participate actively and in which we are always being supported by international corporations that we highly value and that we are thankful for. 
Another important point that I need to highlight are the national plans. In our case, we are working tirelessly to achieve that. And tomorrow on Wednesday, precisely on the 9th, we are going to have our second workshop to review this, as Mr. Laudato mentioned. We are going to review potential actions, just like in the neighboring countries, we are going to take into account different uh, uh, action areas known as the seven pillars of the decade. I've been in this commission for a couple of years, but this has allowed me to know more, to move forward as a farmer, and also to get to meet other producers in other countries that are suffering similar difficulties, that have the same dreams and that are facing the same uh, challenges that we are facing. And in this brief, time frame, I have to tell you that I've learned that we shouldn't feel discouraged and the only way to overcome most of our issues is participation. And as engineer Juanita always says, it's not about moving too fast and too far. It's all about holding on, keep moving, keep, mush, keep pushing for public policies to resist and persist. And the decade is no longer a decade. It's only five more years that we have ahead of ourselves. And we have to continue working on giving visibility to the importance of our work as producers of healthy foods, respecting the environment and the biodiversity of our planet. For this reason, I'd like to mention once again that REAF and the decade of family farming are opportunities for all of us and at the same time are a challenge, a huge challenge, right? Not only regionally, but at the world level. And most importantly, it puts us food producers at the core, and this is something that we will achieve only through collaboration of all participants. Without further ado, thank you so much for the invitation, and thank you to all the organizations that organized this event, and I hope that whenever you want, we are at your service. The doors of Paraguay are open to know more about our work our fields, our dreams, our realities, and challenges. Thank you once again to the authorities of the country that are leading the instances and that are making efforts to achieve the proposed goals. I'd like to wish you the best success to the pro tempore chairmanship. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I am super proud as a person, as a woman of Paraguay, and we are willing to see you soon and happy to see you in Paraguay. Thank you. Thank you, Mariela, Manuel, Lautaro, for introducing everything that you have been doing. I see that there are some people from the Ministry of Agriculture in Chile and uh, in Paraguay. The RIAF is a space that moves cooperation. It's been financing cooperation for 15 years already in the light of the REAF. And I think that there is a lesson learned here about that space, about how we are circulating this knowledge. This is related to an exchange and uh, also so uh, we have gone to Uruguay, to Brazil, and we're dialoguing and building solutions, seeing how we can advance jointly in some of the challenges that have been uh, said here. And as final conclusions of what we have been seeing and what we have been talking about in this space and also in different activities that we have been accompanying and organizing, we can see how in the region the family agriculture is in the agenda of priority of the countries, of the organizations, producers, uh, and the um, different spaces. That priority is consolidated. We need to have this. Uh, we have the letter of Santiago that was uh, elaborated in 2022, and we need to incorporate it in the, solu in the solutions that we have for the region and for family agriculture and other instruments. 
para la agricultura familiar, campesina, indígena y afrodescendente de la región. This is very important for the Sika region. There are milestones, there are instruments that put family agriculture in the agenda of priorities for the uh, countries and for the organizations. And we also saw that there is a complete program, a complete progress in your way, for example, the case of your way that was presented here, and that prioritizes the participation of women and young people in strategies for sustainable development. And that link family agriculture with a strategy through different uh, tools, a registry and the policies for credit. There's a pool of solutions that we are seeing here that we are uh, making progress on. This is all based on the political dialogue. It's a mechanism that is going to be very important in this process. And again, I want to talk about the participation to generate consensus and commitments that prioritize uh, family agriculture in different areas that I already mentioned. Dialogue is the heart of family agriculture, and I think that here in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have seen how the process of dialogue can be transforming, and how from dialogue we can generate different institutionalities and progress in family agriculture to use in a sustainable way the different resources and territories. So there's a lot of experience here. And we talked to Ms. Gia Taylor that came from the uh, women producers. And I, we want for her to tell us how this platform is advancing in the solution uh, building. There was a problem with connections there, but we are uh, talking to her. We are unable to have the people from the Caribbean, but we see that there is a positioning of Latin America and the Caribbean and the operation that we have. We want to build different links for the next decade, and that is what we have as a message and what we are going to be using and uh, doing next week. As Mariela and Inola said, there are topics that demand for us to be able to keep on working together and building consensus, for example, access to land. And there's a lot of progress in the region, but we still have pending challenges for example, the programs that guarantee the access, sustainable access to land, other things uh, just as uh, association, those things uh, need a structured support from politic, public policies. And with that progress, we can continue. I think that there is a topic that is important and that is related to the nature of the dimension of uh, inequalities reduction and also resiliences in dealing with the challenges that we have due to climate change. This is an um, overarching challenge and policies need to talk about how to strengthen that. As Mariela said, as Maria Noel mentioned as well, diversify production and also improve the strategies that will allow to deal with the different aspects and also recognize the support that uh, we get in some of the challenges. Family agriculture has contributions, and this is what we are seeing here and what we already see in the implementation process, in the different policies and the different dialogues that we have. And again, I think that here we have a lesson learned that it is at the same time a big contribution 
which is related to the power of coordination, dialogue, and alliances. Everything that we have been hearing here is what is reinforced, and that is what has generated the most advance that we have seen. It's dialogue, it's coordination, and collective action from the uh, circulating knowledge that we have here. I think that we have a, a lot of uh, progress that we have made, and I think that the next five years, what we need to focus on is to consolidate those um, that knowledge and to be able to see the perspective of opportunities. Family agriculture has a lot to do, has a lot to take advantage of in these opportunities. And of course, I think that there is a commitment that is explicit of everybody that has been participating to strengthen participation based on dialogue so that we can um, continue uh, delivering responses that will allow for family agriculture to deploy their potential and also contribute to the transformation of agri uh, agricultural um, information. That is something very important. We need to talk about everything that we are doing in an inclusive way, and I think that this is still a pending challenge that we have of how we can advance. So I would like to advance in um, thanking all of you. Um, I know that many of you are in lunch times, so we always had a very active audience here. Everything that we have presented here is available not just in the regional platform of FAO that uh, Luis mentioned, but we also are connected through social media. And we would really like to have you for the decade discussions. We're going to have the, the Global Forum in Rome. We know that there's a lot of participation and a lot of things that are interesting that come from there. So we're going to be talking about how we can land the recommendations that we have from there to our reality and how we can find solutions. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Lautaro, Melissa, and uh, each and every one of you that have supported the implementation and the construction of this dialogue space and all of this, our team from FAO with IT, the interpreters. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we are going to keep uh, being connected and working together so that we can advance towards uh, the decade that we want to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.